excited. So Matt came in and he shared with me a little bit about his garden a few weeks ago. And I thought, wow, this is so interesting. And it was so well documented and prepared and put together. I was like, we got to have you on our garden guest series. And thankfully he agreed. Um, and Mr. Thayer is one of our master gardeners. He's been with us for five years now. Um, he's very active. We recently, um, this last week, have been setting up our new compost project that he's been heading up for all of us. So he's very helpful and a joy to have in the group. And so without further ado, Mr. Matt there will present to us his garden. Thank you, Angela. I don't know if I deserve all that praise. I, I know I don't, but um, I'll take it. <laughs> so just to give you an idea, uh, we arrived um, Tennessee into, from Texas into Tennessee five years ago. I'd never gardened before. Uh, I have an electrical engineering background in the high tech field and um, that and other things that uh, consume my life. So um, I'm gonna share with you kind of the things, some of the things I've learned, some of the challenges uh, through these five years. There we go. So we started in 2016 um, and I really only had one tool. See that pedal garden hoe? That's what I had. Uh, the tiller you see in the, in the far distance there, was rented. So I did have plenty of rocks and I found a good way to, to use them, uh, essentially making some stone walls. That year we had some drought conditions. And so um, this just kind of kicked off my learning experience. Uh, joining the Master Gardeners that year, took the class and there's a number of things I learned. Uh, one of the things is soil is very important. And so uh, anyone can look online and find out essentially a soil profile for their area. I have references in the back of this presentation. You'll see the little number one down there. So you can uh, all show those at the end. So it'll be captured and you can all go to those and uh, have fun. So um, soil is very important. We had clay. Um, you can see uh, in the triangular map, texture triangular map down there. Um, there are a couple of Cool things you can do though, you can, you can take a, a jar, fill half with soil, add water, a little bit of soap, shake it around, let it settle for a few days, and you'll kind of see what you have. And so there's some really practical things you can do. Uh, one of the things I learned in Master Gardeners, hey, you need to know about the, the nutrients and also the pH of your soil. Other things that are important, how well does your soil absorb the moisture? I mean, clay does stay wet longer, but it, it keeps um, moisture uh, within the soil that can't be extracted by the plants. And so you need to be, you know, just because it's wet doesn't mean the plants are happy. And so there are things you can do, like take a PVC pipe, knock, uh, pound it into the ground, put some water in it, see how well your uh, soil is actually um, absorbing uh, the, that water versus runoff. So we had a lab, to, uh, a soil test done. This is the initial results. And yep, we confirmed it was acidic. Just don't assume because others in your area say it's acidic, it is. Because I've talked with other master gardeners that said they thought it was acidic, added lime and said, oops, uh, it wasn't actually that way. So have a soil test done. We were low in phosphorus. Our organics were miserably low in calcium with bad too. So because of the drought conditions, because of the calcium issues, we had uh, blossom end right with the tomatoes. This is what our fall garden looked like. You know, when I dive into something, I try to do it big. Um, the thing here is though, um, you really wanna be planning your garden um, and you'll learn each year from that. So the first year's garden was okay. Soil was real clay. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side there, I added a bunch of mulch. Um, and I love learning. It's one of the things I do and enjoy. And so I'll, I'll tap not only master gardeners, look online, uh, read books. Uh, actually a, an important source of information for me with other farmers. And so um, you, know, you use what knowledge you can. Of course, you're gonna lose, you're gonna learn through trial and error as well, but um, hopefully shorten that up a little bit. So this is our 2017 garden. Uh, you know, we put in garlic. Um, we did a number of other things. We had the Kentucky Wonder Pole beans, which unfortunately I'm still eating today. They're very stringy. So that was one of the things I learned is that, you know, if you don't want dental floss while you're eating these canned beans, uh, don't choose that variety. 
also uh, a number of the master gardeners said, you know, choose these big tomatoes like the Cherokee purple mortgage lifter, things like that. And later on, we learned that it's really not the way we wanted to go because they take longer uh, to fully ripen and bugs and other critters get into them. And, uh, and so we, we kind of learned these things over time. So um, since the first year was a lot of drought conditions, we uh, implemented some rain collection. And so the one in the upper left-hand corner that's uh, actually connecting to the downspout, it's kind of a, a neat way of doing things. This is actually a Fisker's uh, rain, uh, it's a diverter. So what happens is that when the fluid in the uh, rain barrels reaches above that hose level, all the rain is then diverted down the spick down the downspout rather than into the rain barrels to overflow it. So it's a pretty cool way. Um, but I had a larger garden, so I put in a couple of the 250 gallon tanks there. Also this coast, uh, compost pile at the bottom there, it's just a larger version of what uh, Evangeline was referring to that we just put in uh, to the cannery here um, just in the past couple of weeks. Uh, you wanna, you wanna um, have those made with uh, what your implements you're going to be using. I have, a, I have a tractor now, so I made it wider than six feet so I can easily move it around there. So um, again, because uh, water was important, uh, we, we, we had put some um, blueberries in and I needed a kind of a portable solution for that. And so we have a creek that's down the road quite a ways away from where the gardening area is. So essentially there's a 48 gallon tank put in the front end loader, use a two cycle pump to pump it up. And then um, in this case, use gravity to let it feed the, the plants. Uh, I did purchase a couple of gardening tools, uh, uh, Canterbury pole fork, which I found very useful for, oh, it's useful for moving mulch and other things. A uh, good spade fork is important. This, um, one of the things I was really frustrated early on is that, you know, I use these permanent markers. They say permanent markers. Well, you put them out in the sun, they fade, can't read them anymore. And I found that a China marker works really well. And what's nice about that is that you can just use a little WD-40 and wipe, and wipe it clean and reuse the, the marker again. So I use this for, you know, canning. I use it for marking everything. This just shows the blueberry patch layout. One of the things I learned is, boy, you need to have more than one variety. In this case, I had three different varieties and said, you know, I want them to come out at different times. So that's it, that kind of thing. Blueberry patch the, the first year. The other thing that we did early on was we said, okay, you know, we don't know a whole lot about this gardening. Uh, so we bought a lot of plants. And so that changed over time. Now you can see here on the left-hand side, the soil is looking a lot better. Um, we, I just, um, in Athens, there's, um, a public works department that actually you can get free mulch from. And uh, during non-COVID times, they actually will load it for you on Fridays. Um, and people come from all around to do that. And um, so that's why it's looking healthier on the left-hand side there. The right-hand side, I expanded the garden so it doesn't look quite as nice. A little bit further growth. Um, and then we started trellising. So in the first year we had, um, uh, bush beans. And I found that I don't like bending over and so and, and hunting for those beans. And so you want to take into account, um, you know, your physique for lack of a better term. And uh, one of the local farmers, organic farmers, we try to do, we're trying to do things organically here. Uh, we're not certified, but you know, this is what we're geared toward. But um, there's some, um, it's that you have this pl plastic mesh and uh, on top of that plastic mesh, you have its uh, galvanized um, electric fence wire that I string along and then I actually use baling twine to actually go along the top and along each T post. And so that has worked really well for, for beans and peas, things like that, um, something you might consider. So, you know, I'd heard about Oh, this Florida weave is the next the best thing since uh, sliced bread. Uh, perhaps Evangeline can talk about that a little more because she is from Florida. But I tried it out and um, didn't care for it. So if you look at the upper left-hand corner, I kind of show how it's it's um, sinusoidal waveform. Um, it's you have the weaving back and forth between each plant. 
Well, the problem with that is that these tomato plants grow at different um, you know, rates. You have some short ones and then you have taller ones and then the shorter ones are catch off and you have to try to weave around them. It, it was a real pain. So um, that's a method I tried that I would not go back to. Um, I also read on the internet, you know, these really tiny seeds were bothering me. How do you get them down precisely? And one of the persons, one um, couple of people said, oh, use uh, toilet paper, separate it and put the, put the seeds in there and bind it back together. And it didn't work very well. So wouldn't recommend that one. Um, this high tunnel construction. So last I said, it's really good to know your local farmers. Uh, I uh, helped put together a couple of tunnels, actually three. And so it's a good learning experience and, and you get to share a lot of knowledge and in fact, um, in, in produce as well. I uh, shared some sweet potatoes for some, um, for some ginger and some lettuce just the other day. Um, a good book that I read was this Mark Gardner. I talked about financials, lean practices. I mean, from the semiconductor industry or even the auto industry, they talk about lean practices. Who would have thought for gardening? Well, you think about it, when you're setting up your garden, you wanna put things that are gonna be in close proximity. So if some people have like a little box out at their garden, you can go and get the tools you use all the time rather than going back and forth from the garage uh, out to the garden. So that's one practice you can, you can use. Um, Talks about production, crop planning, weed management, things like that. Um, another uh, good author is Elliot Coleman. I'm talking about, uh, he has a book called New Organic Grower. And he talked about tillage methods, movable tunnels, things like that that are kind of cool. So of course we all have challenges in the first, you know, in the first year or so, things weren't too bad. The, the bugs didn't know that I had a garden, and, um, and but they did find out soon enough. And so um, we ran into some corn earworm problems and fruit worms. Um, and the thing for corn that I learned is that you need to plant it early. If you wait later in the year, more and more pests, and this is really much true for a lot of your gardening, they really, um, they really come out and um, eat more than you do. Um, Watermelon splints, that's a lot that can be due to um, uh, watering. You know, I don't regularly water. Um, and so that's a problem there. Now, the, um, the hornworm is kind of cool, um, although you don't want it in there. Um, I went to a Harbor Freight, got one of those little black lights. You can go hunting for them at night. So something you might want to try on Halloween or something. Mm -hmm. Although there, there are very few right now given given where we are in the season. Some more pests. So I kind of listed these from, boy, these boogers are easy to these are a lot more difficult. So, you know, the, um, the aphids, you, you can either just spray them off, add a little soap to the water. And um, if you want to dry them out, use some um, baking soda in there. The uh, potato beetles, they're really slow. You can pick them up and throw them in soapy water. No problem at all. I had a real problem with squash bugs. And so, you know, there are organic methods, um, you know, uh, organic insecticides, I guess you'd say, but I'm, I'm not to speak about those things or recommend anything there, but I will tell you what, I've, um, what, I, what I have found to be useful for me is really, I just rip those darn little or, um, red seeds off, squish them. And if you do that oftentimes enough, by the time your plants are pretty well producing, the boogers, uh, the squash bugs have, have, you know, they've come out at that time and, and, and they're not gonna you know, be any, you've already harvested essentially. Japanese beagles, beetle, beagles. <laughs> um, some folks, some organic firms actually use bug brew. So they, they'll squish them up, let them ferment in the garden in some water and then sprinkle that around. Um, I've not tried that technique. Cucumber beetles are a pain because they fly around and cause all sorts of problems. Um, uh, just plant a little bit more is what I'd recommend there. So the larger pests, uh, fortunately I have a really good dog. You can see her in the middle there uh, approaching a frog, uh, but she takes care of the larger, larger vermits. Um, one thing I also learned is that it's really good to store up for the next year. So I have an area in our woods that I store mulch. So I'll collect it 
um, you know, through the winter, and then it makes it really easy to uh, put it out uh, the next, uh, for the next season. So this is kind of what we uh, done that year. You can see the garlic hanging and drying. Uh, there's some, um, we had sweet potatoes. We have, I learned that um, we produce, we can produce more than we really want. And so it shows uh, cucumbers there. And I mean, I was asking my neighbors to have cucumber baths and we, we just, we just had, we're donating left and right. They're just, you can overplant. And I still haven't learned that lesson really well. Um, also learned about um, trap crops a little bit. And so that this, um, this is squash in the middle. Um, it actually, um, you know, it will attract um, some of the bugs away from, um, it's a Hubbard squash, it'll attract them away from the other squash that is. Here's our sweet potato harvest, 1200 pounds of sweet potatoes. You know, so we, we, we gained a lot of friends in uh, the uh, local charities like this as well. Uh, yes, we, we tried a number of different varieties, uh, Georgia Jet, um, uh, what else do we try? Vardaman, we didn't, the Vardaman's sweeter, but it's, um, it's, it, it's not as plump. And so we've kind of gone away from those. Um, and we get those from the local co-op around here. They get slips, but you have to have your timing just right to get them because they go fast. Mm -hmm. We also uh, took advantage of the cannery here. Uh, Mary Lou is a, uh, uh, she's a wealth of knowledge. And so we, this is what we can that year. And we tried our, uh, we tried uh, going to the farmer's market. One of the advantages of the farmer's market I found was that getting to get to know the other farmers. And I don't claim to be a farmer, believe me, but um, you know, I was just uh, seeing what it would, how it would go. But one of the things I did was um, I wanted to look, uh, I didn't want to compete unfairly with the other farmers. That's not doing anyone any good. Mm -hmm. And so there is a reference at the back there. Um, University of Kentucky actually has a website you can go to and actually look at the different markets like in Chattanooga, Knoxville, and see what the prices are over different weeks. And so I use that to set our prices. Uh, you also have to be worried about are people bringing in things shipped or are they locally grown? We had a farm inspection to make sure that we were actually growing it. Uh, in different farmers markets do things differently. So the one in Athens is free. Some take a percentage of your earnings. Some have an annual or per uh, visit fee. Some you have to work really hard to actually get into. You have to build up a reputation. And so couple other things, vegetables can't be processed. And if you're gonna get in really into it and actually make better sales, you, you need to have a calibrated a scale that's calibrated every year. Just to give you an idea, at the end of that year, um, one guy who is doing this for, I guess, um, retirement was selling cucumbers at 10 cents each. I said, I'd rather freaking donate them than sell them for 10 cents each. And so, you know, that doesn't do anyone any good. Uh, some of the other things I've learned, you know, you really need to determine what you're going to plant in the strategy. So you know, I like to um, do things that I enjoy to eat. Um, you know, you can donate to local charities. Think about how you're going to either can or freeze um, your vegetables, how much space you have. And also, why are you doing this? So, you know, we wanted to know uh, where our food's coming from. We wanted to be able to expand the varieties that we have, uh, especially now with, with, with COVID. I mean, if you look back in World War I, World War II, they had these victory gardens. And when I go to some of these charities, they have lines lined up for this food. And so you know, even a small area can, can do a lot of good and give you a little bit more comfort there. Um, you need to know the timing uh, in terms of when to plant things. Uh, there are a lot of good uh, resources here, a number of good UT uh, publications. There's a, a calendar that's put out each year. There's another, there's a reference of a publication that Natalie put out that goes through vegetable gardening, shows you how deep to put it, when to put it out, you know, what kind of yield you should expect. You know, and there's stuff online as well. 
So then we got into indoor indoor uh, growing. And so this shows uh, initial setup. I've expanded it since then. Um, I went with LED, something that went in both the blue and red spectrum. Uh, you can get LED that's one or the other. A uh, couple of reasons I went with LED. One is I didn't want to um, have too much power drawn on the particular circuits I was using in the house. Um, the uh, fluorescent bulbs, you know, a lot of uh, farmers will use the T8. T12s aren't quite uh, strong and provide enough intensity. The problem is, is that, you know, you go to return them when they failed. A lot, uh, there are a lot less places accepting them now. And, the, you know, there's carcinogens on the inside of those things. It shows this uh, cell flat preparation at the bottom. I just took some Tyvek to use on the uh, building homes. And to put that in a box, it helps it keep it clean and uh, you mix some uh, fertilizer and some seed starting mix and voila. Also started uh, saving seeds and uh, continue to do that. Want to plan your space? I mean, I'm showing a lot of space here, but you can, you can do a lot with uh, small areas. And so um, just because I went, what my wife would say, overboard, um, don't let that deter you. Um, consider cool and warm season plants, uh, succession planning. So uh, for instance, we would start beans in one area and then wait a few weeks and start them again. So that way you're not you know, harvesting all at once. Um, and uh, also consider the tools that you have. And so if you have a, a tiller of a certain size, uh, you, know, you can adjust your row width for that. And also the plants that you're putting out, you know, those, those um, uh, watermelon go all over the place, so the cantaloupe and so we'll take that into account. Here's a simple example of rotation. And so I wasn't rotating the first couple of years uh, to any big degree. It doesn't matter too much initially, but then you really need to do that later because, you know, because of diseases and pests and, and the soil fertility. And so I then started putting in cover crops and things like that. Um, also, you can think about, all right, I have some potatoes I wanna grow. Um, I can get, I can use a, a full potato, dig it, put it in a little bit deeper so it has enough energy to come up a little further and you can plant it earlier or you cut it in half and, and plant it not as deep. And so you can think about when you're gonna be planting what and what temperature it'll see. Uh, season extension. So we use uh, row covers. Um, and um, the reason why I'm not using a high tunnel at this point is because I don't have a regular source of water. Uh, you know, we are on well water. I didn't really want to tap into that at this point. Um, but uh, you can do a lot with these. Uh, this is agribound. You can get anywhere like Johnny's or any other place. And um, I use just the... Um, uh, there's a fence wire that you can get um, at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's uh, that you just string in hoops. And uh, it's really easy to set that up. So 2018 garden, you can see the buckwheat. I've actually found buckwheat to be really nice because it's really, really, really easy to weed. And the, the uh, bees just love it. Um, here's a, you can see this. In this case, we had Bowler Garden, Georgia Jet. You'd asked about the um, kind of sweet potatoes. We went away from the Vardaman. Um, and um, yeah, I guess that's all I want to say about this one. So then um, for the first year saying, boy, this is really acidic. I went out and got some, um, some lime and you can get it in a couple different forms. You can get the powder and essentially they take a Bobcat front loader and dump it into the back of your truck. And that's what I did where you can get the grain yellows in bags. And the powder is cheaper, but the problem with that is that um, you don't want to put it in your uh, spreaders, whether it's a hand spreader or uh, something that goes behind a tractor because it'll actually damage it because so fine it gets, gets in there. So you can think about that. But um, I did then apply it again the second year just saying, oh, it's probably still acidic. Well, I was wrong. And so if you look at two years later, my garden actually became basic. And so to... Um, to fix that, uh, I just tilled a little bit deeper, brought that soil up to uh, bring some of that acidic soil in to, to, to make it work out. 
Uh, you can see initially my phosphorus is low. I had added some um, chicken manure that brought it up. And uh, you can see my or I added a lot of mulch so organics came up to optimal level. So this is, uh, I then wanted, we had been getting more rain and so I really needed to look at weed control. And so if you'll notice, I, I mulched the heck out of it because it's a free source. Um, and then I also put down agricultural cloth. And so if you look at this, um, using my pointer here, this cloth for the walkways, we got this at the co-op. It actually comes in 15 foot wide sections and you can get as long as you want. Our garden's a little less than hundred feet long. And so uh, we actually cut it into strips, uh, five feet each. Um, we also experimented with another form of trellising the cattle panel trellis and so you can take some t-posts this is actually two cattle panels that are bent together uh, you just um, have them slightly off the ground you can use the electrical wire ties or just um, aluminum wire to tie into the t-post and it works really well for we had cucumbers this year you can have beans and it looks nice too so, um, it's for weight control. The other thing that I'd like to add is you need to have the right tools and I'll get to that in a little bit. I guess I'll get to it right now. So a uh, couple of tools that I found um, very useful is a scuffle hoe. Um, you actually, this is a triangular one. Um, and uh, actually a good source for looking at tools. I'm not promoting anyone here, but they have some good videos on different tools and uh, what you look for in a tool, it's, it's earth tools. Um, some really neat stuff. Um, but the scuffle hoe, you essentially get it just below the surface. So you're essentially scuffling below the roots, back and forth. It has blades on both sides of that, all sides of that triangle. And you can get things up. It's really good for going down rows. That onion hoe is like it refers to as good around onions. Um, one thing that helped me a lot since I was getting so much mulch was to get a, a cargo bed unloader. And so if you look in the lower left-hand side, it shows how I lay it out. And so essentially you have it wrapped around itself. You put the tailgate down and then there's this crank here that I'm cranking it out. And it'll pull off the, the back portion first and then the front portion. And the reason why that's important is because if you try to do it all at once, it's too much weight. And so, especially when it's wet. So that's a nice tool you have. You can get that. Um, I've been told Harbor Freight has it. Um, and I got mine at Northern Tool, although I wouldn't recommend that one. Um, just the design, I had to, fi had to fix it two weeks later. This is the buckwheat, you see the bees love it. So I expanded my garden implements. I got a, a plow, tiller, and a flail mower. So the way the flail mower works, it's, it's a mower, but it chops up um, your grass. Instead of like the side discharge mowers, it actually will, um, you won't get clumps of, um, uh, of uh, the greens because it's really good for the garden. Okay. Um, I tried uh, staggering, uh, tried improving the trellis techniques, uh, staggering the tomatoes, that didn't work out as well. And I'll, I'll show you another method that's easy, even better. I did use T-posts in kind of a square pattern. That worked great for the cherry tomato plants because um, unlike these um, wire cages you put around it, you can't get your hand through. This you can set the height to whatever you want. And um, it's really good. I also improved the way we put in potatoes. I just plow it, dump the tomatoes and cover it up. Uh, we also did black bean harvesting, and so I found that um, there are a number of ways to, to um, shell them, and I found that taking, putting them in a pillow and pounding the heck out of that pillow, that's a good way of doing it. And it shows that I have them stored, and then I use this bean, um, bean bag, put it in with the rice. I bake out the rice first, and it adds to uh, absorb the, new, the uh, moisture. These are... Um, 2018 garden. Uh, one thing I also learned is that how do you, you know, you don't, you don't thump on tomatoes to find out if they're ripe. You look for a tendril that's just off 
just off, I'm sorry, I said tomato, I meant watermelon, just off the watermelon. And um, when that tendril has turned brown, it's ready to go. Shows our 2019 garden, keeps getting better. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention at this point, it's very, very good, you know, to uh, keep records. And so I keep records of the, the things that we order, the varieties, uh, how we plant them. I, uh, there's a, a good source, uh, Dave's Garden uh, gives, um, actually folks um, rate different seed suppliers, uh, but I keep track of that for myself. Also any learnings from the garden, this shows the, the um, kind of spreadsheet looking thing there. It shows what I planted in each cell flat when I was um, you know, growing them indoors. Also, you know, take it to any advantage of, um, uh, of learning. So this is an example of when I've uh, made presentations for the Master Garden Group, I try to choose things that I want to learn. And so I learned about uh, you know, sharpening and, and taking care of tools, went to a workshop, read up, did a bunch of work. And then I shared it, got some good questions and keep learning. And so um, Master Garden or other forms are great sources for, you know, I wanna develop myself, I wanna learn. Um, and so, you know, last year I didn't know enough trees in my yard. So I can learn about the different variety of trees and then uh, present about it, but then COVID stopped that one. Um, this is the method I prefer for actually trellising at this point for the tomatoes and other plants. I just have a single set of T-posts, string on either side, and I have um, them about five to six feet apart. I actually tie, I've improved it this year, I actually tie these together and you can actually slide that little knot back and forth, tighten or loosen, and it keeps the plant from moving along the, um, you know, parallel to the, um, the strings. It, it's a much better way of doing things. Uh, this shows uh, we went into dry bean production mode. It went to mother stallard and snow cap. I used that improved trellis method for peppers. Um, also, it's, we learned to flash freeze cantaloupe. And so you take your cantaloupe that's ripe, it's just dropped off the vine. You scoop it out with a little, uh, it's almost like an ice cream scooper, but smaller. Put that on a tray, freeze it, bag it, and the rest of the dregs you have for breakfast. Really nice way of doing things. I did peanuts for the first time last year because I like peanuts. And here's what they look like, okay? I just harvested my next, uh, our last, uh, more this last, actually last week I harvested them. Um, took some sprigs, Concord grape vines that my um, neighbor had and uh, planted it and I'm gonna be trellising it this winter. Also tried artichokes. So artichokes uh, a little more challenging. Um, the first year, you know, we got this one artichoke and, but they produced the next year and the next year. And so I actually had to use Agarbon to cover them over the winter. And um, you'll see um, we did quite well there. I tried white clover winter crop. I don't like it because when you're weeding, it's really painful to get them out of there. I really prefer the buckwheat, but there's a lot of different things you can try there. Uh, this shows expanded the uh, mulching. There's, I don't know if you've heard of woofers before, but that's my woofer. Uh, mm -hmm. Woofers are actually people that uh, come out and work on um, farms uh, in order to learn. And so some of my uh, organic farmer friends have uh, students from all over the country that do that. Uh, we expanded our rain water collection. This is not as efficient as using the gutter, but it worked for a remote solution for uh, the berries. Here's a 2020 garden. It shows you some of the things we did. Um, you know, we focused on medium-sized tomatoes, did much better. We expanded our pea production. Here's some more things looking real good. You know, sometimes when you learn things, it does work out. Um, here's some carrots. Our, one thing we learned, carrots, you need to water to keep them watered for a long time. Um, and 
both like those and garlic and sweet potatoes and peanuts, mulch the heck out of them. <laughs> this shows the artichokes. Uh, I, you know, had a bunch this year. Here's the artichoke flower in purple there. And we started uh, growing indoor lettuce and, and microgreens. And so I always hated that you, know, you start out, you get greens early in the spring, and then by the time the tomatoes start coming, no more greens. And so we started growing them indoors. But our farmer friends that have the irrigation actually uh, cover um, the kind of the dark cloth, the shade cloth. I also like you know, those sesames that you get on your, um, your hamburger buns. And so I grew sesame this year. Um, basically cut, cut them down, you're drying them and then you thrash them and you can see the little sesame here. Unfortunately with these sesame, you know, um, uh, they dry at different rates. And so these will split and they actually, um, pods will open, speed, seeds can drop out. Whereas you have green ones right above, that's why you cut them in and let them dry out. In, in Texas, they, um, they have developed varieties that actually um, mature at the same time and then they spray them to actually dry them. So here's our peanuts. Um, this in 2019, I didn't have a very good method of drying them and so I improved it. This is actually uh, hardware cloth screens and many layers of peanuts. And so this is currently in our basement. And into canning mode here, um, some people said, oh, you know, you, uh, roast them and they'll do a lot be a lot better so i'm i have four splits experiments going on and different methods of canning uh, this was actually at the bradley county master gardener i'm sorry the uh, bradley county cannery with a thing of soup um more fun and um this is actually some of our early soil but my dog loves putting bones in there so let me show you some of the references here I'll pause it here for a minute and then I'll go to the next slide. Here's the next set of references. You're, you said it was a mulch, but is it um, mulch or is it wood chips? It's actually uh, ground up leaf, leaf mulch. And so the, oh. the, the uh, city of Athens will collect um, the leaf mulch from the yards and driveways and, and um, Grind it up. Now it does have trash in it, but um, no, it's it's a lot of leaf mulch. Yeah, we have that too at the in the city. If anybody yeah, hears, it, yeah. Okay, in Cleveland, I understand that they have it, but um, they won't load it for you. Um, and um, and you have to kind of make an appointment to 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 have them unlock the gate for you to get it. In That's Athens, cool. you can go there anytime, and during non-COVID. And typically on Fridays, they'll just load it for you. Well, that's nice. It is. Yeah, the city of Chattanooga has a brush pit where they have um, um, wood chips. And I think they do have composted. Well, it's not composted, but at least it's grass clippings and things like that. So it's probably better, like you do, is keep a nice big pile for the next year. Well, in Athens, um, for instance, they have stuff that's two years old and one years old, and they just started putting out some stuff in this year. Oh. And so we took, we, you know, it depends on how, you know, when they were loading it, a lot more people came. Um, you know, we had people come up from Georgia to load. So. Oh, you can, other people in, in Chattanooga in the city, only city residences can, can get it from that, what we call the brush pit. It's over by the 911 center off of um, Amnicola Highway for anybody listening here from Hamilton County. If I can show my screen, I can show you the big mound of... Yeah, it's great. Let me, uh, let me go back here. Here I... Um, let's see. Yeah, they, they um, you know, you're required to fill out a form and, uh, and then have a tarp. I'm trying to find the... There you go. Okay, see the upper left-hand corner here? Yep. They have rows of these that go quite a ways back. Wow. You yeah. can see it's, I mean, I load my truck up to the very top cab, but people bring their trailers and people will bring, you know, garbage cans that they don't, you know, 
have a truck for you know, go out there and load it. I definitely recommend not loading it after a rain like today because it's heavy. And then how how thick do you put it in your garden? I overdo it because my mine was so had so much clay, but I'll 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 put it you know three inches thick if it, or thicker if I need to. Yeah. But you know actually one of the things I've failed to mention is that another thing you do in your soil is when we started I'd take a certain volume of soil and actually count the number of worms. And now years later I do the same thing and we're getting worms galore. And, and it's just a tremendous how much the mulch can help you with weed control and also I mean we only had to water a couple of times this year because it re retains moisture so well. How many the of those part is just loading it yourself? How many of those rainwater collection dealies and where did you get your um, I think that's 350 gallons, right? Uh, there are, um, I think there are 150 each. Let me think here. I now there are 200, there are 250 each. Um, we expanded our, sorry, they're collecting, um, tree cuttings today. We have, um, seven altogether, six that are attached, uh, to a rain, uh, gutter system. And this seventh is remote with a tarp. And um, we ended up going up near uh, Knoxville to get the latest ones, but you can get them locally also. And uh, I ganged them together uh, with uh, PVC and I made it so I could uncouple the PVC and then drain them every year so the, the trees won't damage anything. Very good. Someone wanted to know the breed of your dog. Well, um, she, um, first of all, she found me. I was out mowing and she just started following me around. I took her to the uh, kennel or the local animal shelter. And uh, they said she's an all American breed, but I understand that she's a, uh, she's a Tennessee walking tree hound, at least mostly. Um, yeah, she's a wonderful dog. And, and that cat there, He's more like a dog. He'll follow me everywhere. When I'm weeding on my knees, he'll be on my back. He'll jump in the, they'll both jump in the back of the truck. Um, so I have actually two woofers helping me there. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have that to keep. So you've been able to do it without having a lot of deer then, or you have any deer pressure? Our dog unfortunately keeps the deer away. I, I, I'm split because that's one of the reasons why I actually grew the clover was to attract the deer or a dog chases them off. And so some of the other farmers in the area, that's why they're not planting the sweet potatoes because uh, the deer and rabbits and things will go after them. But our dog, um, our dog keeps them away and it really ups makes me sad during hunting season, but very glad gardening. What did it come from? Close this. And if you look here, Earth Tools is a good source, earthtools.com. And the videos are quite lengthy, but they go through all sorts of different tools. A lot of the better tools are actually from Europe. And um, they also have um, what they call garden tractors, which is a, a tiller that you can have all sorts of different attachments, including a flail and all sorts of things. And so. They're more expensive and you can get them more, you know, I'm not pushing the earth tools, you can get them elsewhere, but really the European brands are made much better than you get at these big box stores. The big box store tillers, um, you know, they're gonna break down in a year or two. You know, you, you go with your passion, you know? Exactly. I, I, I love flying solo, you know? I wanna do that, so I did that. <laughs> What did you say you were? Some kind of engineer, I think. I've seen uh, that. Electrical engineering. I worked at Texas Instruments and also advanced micro devices. Uh, the little right. microprocessors that are in our computers that we're using here come from those companies. And so we were actually doing uh, very, very, um, very, very fine work, submicron. We could we had tools that could look at actually atoms 
um, using <laughs> lasers and ions and all sorts of fun toys that I was telling the Vagline when we went through this before that you, know, you have a little desktop size of desktop. We had tools that were a couple million dollars, just that desktop. Said, Boy, you could buy a good house with that. <laughs> well, it's good to put your brain to work on gardening. I think that's, I think, I think engineers and nurses probably make the best garden. People with background in medical probably make know. the best gardeners. I, I find that I can learn something from almost any garden. And, you know, I, I speak with folks that have been, uh, you know, that talk about how their, their fathers and grandparents did. And, and I learned things. And so, you know, a person's background, I think the biggest thing is you have, you want to learn and you don't necessarily accept what they're saying, but you can verify. There's, a, you know, look at some of the scientific results and even some of them you don't necessarily uh, believe. Well, I think when you said that, yeah, you you went a little overboard, which is great. But I've seen, we had one master gardener some years ago that had a garden, well, maybe half your size. And he was in his 80s and he was doing all those things that you're saying. He was doing a great job. So you've, you know, got, a, you've got a little bit to go. You're kind of a young guy. You, well, I don't know about that. It's all relative. My uh, daughter, when she was young, called me a dinosaur. Now that she's older, I said, have you become one now? Yeah. But um, no, actually... Uh, the health aspect is very important. So when I'm doing all that mulch, I, you know, I'm reminded of that. And, and, you know, I, I had put on quite a bit of weight, um, you know, about a year ago and uh, it's, it's actually helped contribute. So as of Friday, I'll be at 80 pounds less than I was a year ago. Wow. That's great. Um, you know, you, you just, I consider it another project, you know, you, you track your weight, you set goals, you set stretch goals that are reasonable, you track your progress. Yeah. You know, like anything very else. Important. Very important. Um, any other questions we've had? I think we're getting. Are you a, are you a beekeeper, Matt? No, I'm not. Uh, we did have a master gardener about, a, actually it was last year because we had all that wonderful buckwheat um, try to, to, capture some and I have interest in it but you know you can only do so much uh, and and I'm doing too much so uh, I may uh, I may I'm thinking of cutting back on the garden a little bit this next year because uh, we're producing for a good part of the county right now it's wonderful yeah well I've really enjoyed it and I think I think we had a good number of Hamilton County folks and maybe some interns like you said you don't have to do it on a huge scale you can do not at all. A little bit in your backyard. That's what I've got. I've got three or four raised bed boxes. You can do it on your porch or patio. You can do it anywhere, indoors. Right. It's wonderful. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. Hope everybody, everybody's right now saying great job. Thank you. You probably can't see all the chats, but we've got a lot of, a lot of commendations. So I, we appreciate it and I appreciate it. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Well, I want to say thank you to Matt, and I'm sure Evangeline will do the same. Okay, well, I guess we're going to go ahead and uh, log off, but um, everyone have a great day. Thank you again, Matt. Sure.